My name is Clifton Beck. I'm the host of Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. And we spend a lot of time talking about new technologies and trends in the industry and the way that our industry has been evolving at such a rapid pace. And we do get questions on, well, what about the basics? You know, we all have to start with the basics and the fundamentals of our entire industry. So we have some very special guests today. Mr. Michael Kane, president of UEI. How are you, sir? Well, well, thank you. We are grateful to have you here with us. And I know there's a lot going on in this industry and a little show like us isn't the most important things all the time, but the way you represent your family owned business is really important to all of us. Many of us have got our roots in family owned businesses. So your time is very valuable to us. <laughs> and Louise Keller, everyone knows Louise, hangs out with us all the time. Louise, thank you for joining us. You know, we always wonder about how we get involved with the industry. So, Mr. Kane, how did you get involved in the HVAC industry? A place I never thought I'd end up. Well, this is where we're in business. My, my dad, um, I grew up in the UK. Mm -hmm. My father was uh, an orphan immigrant refugee who got to the UK just before Second World War. His real name was Otto, but he changed to Douglas after Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And after the war, he married my mother and uh, with one product, they started the business in 1954. Wow. Uh, one product, one customer, and my mum typed up the invoices on my grandmother's kitchen table, the sort of usual entrepreneurial story. Yeah. Wow. And he had a friend, Ernest May. Uh, Ernest's wife was my mum's best friend, and Ernest invented a digital electronic thermometer. And so, again, from that and one. So it product, began we built up uh, what's now a sort of global test and measurement business. So, wow. uh, and I did something else. And then about 1989, my father's diagnosed with cancer. Uh, 1980s, my father's diagnosed with cancer. Thought I uh, ought to go back to the business. Um, he lived till the year 2000. By then I'd worked in the business for about 10 years. Uh, 1992, we started selling the products we make in the UK through this business, UEI. And um, I just got married and said to my wife, would it be okay if we go and live in America for 18 months? Mm -hmm. And she said, 18 months sounds just fine. And that was 20, nearly 29 uh -huh. years. <laughs> Temporary turned into long term. <laughs> so uh, got here on a visa, got a green card, became yeah. citizen. So... Uh, or 16 years ago, I think, long time ago. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, been here. And well, you know, one of the things I think was very fortunate is my father, most of his career was working with an American company. Sure. So we had a ton of Americans coming through our home when I was growing up. And I think the experience he'd had of living in America and sort of falling in love with it and the experience of growing up was probably a good preparation for living a life that I really didn't plan to live. Sure. Or spending spending it here in America. Um, and so my neither of my parents are alive anymore, but now it's me. My brother runs the UK part of our business. Our eldest daughter has been working in business about six years ago. Uh, again, I, I never imagined that she would do that, but like many of us, we end up in, in HVAC and refrigeration. Yes. And I love these stories because we never know. Uh, you know, many of us will say the same thing. We didn't know that we would end up in HVAC, but in refrigeration and tools and, and the industry. And once you get there, you go, this is actually a pretty good place. So you've witnessed a lot of change in the yep. industry. What have been the largest things that have uh, been really impacted by the tool and test instruments in that period of time? Yeah, it's funny thinking about that in preparing for this because, you know, 1963, we had a, a single digital thermometer with one probe. Yeah, that was a big little, deal. And it was <laughs> in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And you sort of think now, well, that's a big deal, but it really was. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I grew up typing on a mechanical typewriter, listening to long playing records and, yeah. you know, having to book phone calls to my father when he traveled to the USA. Um, sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think one thing is just how technology is developed anyway. That's I mean, been the biggie. we make combustion analyzers. We used to put them in stainless steel suitcases, literally. And of course, <laughs> now they're, they're designed just to fit easily in the palm of your hand. The, the meter that you showed a minute ago, um, you know, has 
10 times the technology of the kind of meters that we sold in the 1980s. Sure. Um, so we're going to be highlighting the DL599 today and yeah. the way that technology has advanced because it really has. But you're so right with how the company evolved into more of a pocket meter, more of that customer experience. When I got into the industry, so I got into the industry in the late 90s and finding tools that were right for you in the field was different than it is now. And UEI has very much evolved. So how has that customer experience been impacted for the business as times have changed? I think there's a couple of areas. I mean, one is that um, just the technology allows us to do things that we, we simply couldn't do before. We didn't right. have wireless technology. We couldn't incorporate so many features into a single device as it were. It just, sure. just wasn't possible. So, I mean, that's that's a very exciting development. Yeah, uh, I think the other thing that we've tried to parallel that with is just a, a real commitment to customer service. We, we, we have a program that is borrowed from something my brother started in the UK. We call it UI Service Plus. Yes. And, and really what it means is that actually at the heart of what we do as a business isn't a product, but a promise. And the promise is a commitment not that we won't let down either our customers uh, or their customers. Now, it applies to one particular group of products, combustion analyzers, sure. but it really characterizes the, the way company. we try to do business. We try to make it really easy for our customers to do business with us. You'll find somebody at the end of a phone 12 hours a day. Um, and, and we, you know, for example, when an analyzer has to be recertified, you know, there's no small print. You can go to our website. You can find exactly what it's going to cost. You can find exactly what the small print is because we say it is the small print. Right. <laughs> you know, just trying to be very transparent. in sure. what we do. And when we say if you, you send your analyzer and if we get it in on Monday morning, we'll ship it on Monday afternoon. Well, we want to prove ourselves trustworthy. And 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 we are doing that. We, we keep that commitment. So it's a way of doing business that's based on a, a promise, a commitment that we won't let our customers down. And I think as a as a family business, you know, most of our customers are family businesses. Most of their most HVAC contractors are family businesses. We know that it is a very tough, very demanding job that can't be done, you know, sitting in an office, uh, tapping away on a MacBook. It's it's a multitude of environments so so we see a very large part of our job is whether it's in the design of our products or whether in the way we do customer service mm -hmm. do that uh in a way that makes it life as easy as possible for the people who use our products and you know who help keep our homes and workplaces safe and comfortable that's 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 the thing that we're in and that's how we try to approach it Love that's, it. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kane. We really appreciate you joining us. And Thanks. it really is a testimony for what the company has been. When I got into the field, we were a very small family owned refrigeration HVAC industry. And the tools of the trade are what brings in the money. That's what keeps you sustainable. And we keep talking about efficiency and how to be efficient. A lot of that is quality tools. And I happen to have my very first meter, <laughs> DL40. I'll show everyone how to find original installation that's manuals. That's for it's, it's it's still, it's loose. It's got a lot of wear and tear. It's had, uh, it's had a few minor screw repairs over the years. Uh, it does have a little bit of super glue on the upper jaw of the clamp, but it still works perfectly. So a testimony to 25 years of use and abuse. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into some new technologies today as well. So, all right. Well, thank you, sir. And Louise Keller. Louise, say hello to everyone. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. So Louise spends a lot of time with contractor education and technician education. And we want to spend a little bit of time today diving into some basic fundamentals of meters that oh, gets overlooked a lot of times. And a lot of times as technicians, especially us guys, we get out of school and we head into our local distributor and we go, ooh, I want the biggest, baddest meter you got up there on that wall. 
and they end up with a meter and they may not understand how everything works. May have learned some basic principles in meters, some basic functions, but didn't learn everything. So Luis is gonna walk us through some deeper understanding of the tool that is a meter at our disposal. Absolutely, well, thank you for that. Uh, so, you know, as we go through, I wanna say thank you to Michael for joining us today, no matter how many times I hear the family story. Uh, during my tenure here at UEI, which is coming up on eight years. Nice. Uh, I still love hearing that story. Um, I think it's just a testament to all of the the investment and hard work that the family has put in for us to be able to bring everybody these great tools. It absolutely is. So I want to start out with a little bit of the basics as far as that goes, right? right? Like, let's just dive down to the absolute basics, which is Ohm's Law. Um. <laughs> A little meditation That's session right, here do. for us today. <laughs> Got to have a little humor in our education. Absolutely. It keeps the attention going. So I love it. Uh, so, but Ohm's Law, it's the yeah. foundation of electricity, right? So if we know two things on the Ohm's Law chart, we're able to calculate out the third. Right. So what this basically says is if we know our volts and we know our amps, we're going to be able to... Um, to get our upside down horseshoe <laughs> from from the technical service technical support side i can't tell you how many times i've had that discussion which is i'm glad you bring that up yeah you know, oh hey, absolutely it'll talk be resistance which one is that is that that horseshoe <laughs> it is and it's a common and, uh, question though because think <laughs> yes. about it like when we're talking about amps and volts that's the only yep. one that's really in a symbol and so we'll we'll talk a little bit about those symbols um as we get a little bit further uh, but again, if we knew our volts and we knew our resistance, we're going to be able to calculate out the amps. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a simple chart. That one, that one's fairly easy to remember once, once you really get it ingrained. But from that, you can actually extract out a little Lots. bit further. You can calculate out a lot more. And so this is just an example of the wheel of electricity, because sometimes maybe we need to know the watts. Um, sometimes, you know, we need to be able to calculate, we have different metrics that are available to us. Uh, so, you know, it's not quite as exciting as the wheel of fortune for me, but mm. the wheel of electricity is a very important thing to know where those things derive from. While oh, we have meters yeah. that are going to calculate most of this stuff, mm -hmm. it's always good to know the fundamentals that exist behind it. I am seeing the will of Ohm's law as a Fun item for a conference. I might have to plug that All right. there. All right. We'll chat more because I think yeah. I can help you with mm, that. Okay. <laughs> but let's just start with one yeah. of the very first things I talked about, Yep. which is amps. And that's a very important thing. It's the big giant A that should be on everybody's meter. And those amps are really when we're going to be looking at the motor lines and current. And depending on the meter that you have, you know, today we're highlighting our DL599. And we're fortunate enough, uh, Clifton has a DL599 in that his hand. hand. Um, and so he is actually able to hook it up and be able to calculate or get the readings for the, the line current. Um, and, you know, depending on your meter, you always want to make yourself familiar with it. So we do all dual displays. So when we're looking at amps, it's always going to be your top display. Now tell me about the auto function that I'm finding on this, because a lot of our previous meters didn't utilize that auto function for each one of their settings. Yeah, so auto, it allows you um, when you're going in there. So not only does our that particular clamp meter, it's going to do AC or DC, and it's going to auto range for you. So if you remember the multimeters, you used to have to go in and you'd have to put where your settings were. I want to be exactly. In this range, yep. <laughs> exactly. So this one is going to auto range for you. Okay. It has a manual ranging function on there too. So um, if you go into that manual oh. ranging. Okay. Yep. If you go into that manual ranging, um, sometimes depending on what your readings are, um, especially when you're looking at really small readings, it's going to just kind of help make that a little bit quicker for your reading. Okay. Yep, so absolutely. So auto ranging is going to make it nice and easy for you. You don't really have to think about, you know, hundreds, tenths, millis, all of those type of things. Sure. So amp readings. So when we're using our tool, it's it's good to know what we're actually generating out of our tool. 
because there are times where we are simply reading what is the input coming from our leads or from our detectors. Sometimes we're actually generating a small amount of voltage that is being applied through our leads or through our clamp meter. So when we're talking about reading our amps, we're utilizing a very small voltage through a magnetic connection. So if you ever notice, we have our metal terminals of our amp clamp so that we can wrap around our conductor to read the magnetic energy that is flowing through that conductor when it has a load flowing through that one. So there's our amp setting. So we'll set that one on. We're gonna measure the amp draw on this particular board. So is this just an 80% gas furnace? It's actually, it's an entire 80% Goodman furnace, except for the blower, we'll reduce the blower on it a little bit. So if we're utilizing it in a training class and we're just simply looking for meter readings and we're looking for our amp draw, we're gonna find our load side. So this happens to be our supply voltage to the control board. We have 0 0.01 amp, which is just a little bit of current being utilized for our control board. And then as we get our load, we'll be able to read that magnetic energy. Now, the great debate, am I flowing electrons or am I generating an electromagnetic field across the conductor? Mm, that'll strike up some interesting emails, I'm sure. That one will continue on another one. But we're actually going to read our magnetic field that's being generated across our conductor. So this particular one, if we apply a small load to it, let's just say we're going to energize our fan relay. We're going to bring on our fan and now we're actually going to be reading some current drawn across that simply from the magnetic conduction going through our conductor. Cool. Right. And you know what else you'll be able to do with your meter? You have it hooked up to the amps. That moves us right along to our volts. Mm, so, you okay. know, when we're looking at the, the system boards or we're yeah. looking at some of that control voltage, you're actually going to be able to see both of your results. So you can see your amp draw and you're going to be able to connect to be able to read your volts on that bottom display. Okay. Which is really nice to be able to utilize volts and your current, your amps all on one screen at the same time. So we'll check that one. So this particular one, we'll just check our incoming current draw. So we know we have 0.23. And we'll check voltage. We'll just simply go on this particular board from our common over to our line hot, which is what we're measuring with our amps. And there we go, 123.5. So the ability to check volts and amps at the same time. Kind of like that. Yeah. Again, it's about that customer experience and how can we make your life easier. So yeah, absolutely. Being able to have that dual display is really important. The other okay. thing, though, mm -hmm. is making sure that we know the difference of is our meter reading AC or DC? Yeah. What kind of voltage do I have flowing through here? Exactly. So what's really nice about um, several of our meters is the fact that it actually has an auto setting on it where it will decide if you are on AC or DC. So you don't have to go through. But it's really important to know what those symbols are that are showing up on your meter. Sure. So Generally, um, when you're looking at the screen of your meter, whether you're on the amps or the volts, you're going to see a couple of different things. And so if you have just the little squiggly line, that's your alternating current. When you have the solid line with the dots underneath of it, that's going to be your DC current because it's only traveling in one direction. And then if you have a meter that is going to be able to discern those and auto calculate you'll see the AC and DC indication, which is the solid line with the squiggly line underneath of it for you. Excellent. Yeah, because all of our previous meters in a lot of manufacturers utilize that. You had separate readings for AC and DC. So how do we know for sure? You know, we may have to jump between them just to find out if it's on a circuit that we're unfamiliar with. And a lot of our older meters didn't have the voltage capabilities, even in the volts AC or volts DC settings. Like I utilized my old DL40. It had high capabilities, had 650 volts AC, but the DC voltage was actually limited. So it was a four volt DC capability. So what kind of voltage capabilities are we talking about now with our newer meters? So I would have to double check all of the specs, um, but those are available on our website. Uh, but we have created since since that DL40, uh, we have definitely expanded out the capability ranges of all of our meters. And we'll talk about why having expanded capabilities are important in a little bit. Okay, awesome. Excellent. 
Uh All right. So I'm going to give you just a little background. You know, I referenced it at the beginning of this. If you if everyone out there wants to know the truth, this entire presentation started with me getting a tech support call that said, what's the upside down horseshoe on my meter? Right. I get that. I've had it before. Sure. Exactly. And it, it's a common question. And that's why I said it's one of the few settings that isn't in as obvious as some of the others, but it's it's resistance. And we know resistance is very, very important um, to make sure that the, the electricity is running through properly, right? Uh, so we're going to be able to test that circuit continuity or specified resistance. Um, and that is literally why we started this. What is it? It's the basis of Ohm's law amps volts and resistance sure so many times when our resistance values come in handy in the field for validating you know the resistance of components and so what are we doing with resistance we are applying a very small dc voltage i actually did it a while ago with my dl40 to measure the voltage coming out so we have a 0.2 volt dc or so range coming out of our meter so we're going to apply a very small DC voltage onto our component, and we're going to measure how much resistance of flow that we have through that component coming back to the meter. So it's very important to understand that on that ohms setting, we don't want to check voltage for it. We don't want to apply power onto an instrument that's already generating a small amount of power. So it's important to understand that we don't have live voltage on it. That's why I just killed voltage going onto our supply source for our for actual test board. Right. And when our resistance is off, we really risk damaging the equipment, right? We risk it overheating. We risk having um, it faulty, uh, fail early. Uh, so being able to check your resistance is one of the keys when we're when we're looking at a full on system check. Absolutely. OK. Yeah. What are the rest of them on that button? So when we move on. Um, capacitance. I think that's one of the most important things um, after your amps, volts, and resistance is capacitance, right? Being yep. able to check those capacitors and decide because all too often a capacitor is bad and we we may assume that it's a board. We may assume it's something else, um, but a capacitor, it's an easy check. So depending on the meters that you have, um, you may see it as this symbol up here on the, the top left corner. Okay. But capacitance is red in your farads, right? So when we look at an actual capacitor, it'll tell you that it is this this um, microfarads. Yep. And then it'll have its plus or minuses on there. Sure. And it's one of the simplest things that we can test to make sure that things are running properly. I don't know if you have a yeah, absolutely. We're going to grab a capacitor test beforehand. Absolutely. Um, Most important. We'll make One sure of our the really is off. neat things about that DL500 series that we're highlighting here is that we actually sped up the amount of time that it read capacitance. Um, it, it's, it's pretty impressive when you see it. Uh, if you don't have one of those, um, and maybe you do have one of our older meters, uh, if you take it um, and you, instead of having it on that auto range, because it starts at nanofarads and then works its way up, you can actually set it to be in the right. So if it's microfarads, you can set it to microfarads and you're actually going to get a little bit faster reading. Oh, okay. Um, but instead of making you go through those extra steps on this series, we just went ahead and um, made it faster for you. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's go through a run real quick. All right. So we're going to check the microfarad ratings on this capacitor. So we're going to set it on that same one, which has multiples. Yeah, let's see what we got here. Just out of curiosity's sake. That's a micro. Oh, I've got our resistance here. There's my ohms. That's right. And if you're never sure, double check your screen, right? It, yeah. It's an easy thing to do, uh, which is why if you notice on a lot of these slides, I also have it highlighted um, where, where you want to be looking on your screen for everything. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, next up. So this is a feature. I think it, it has been underused, uh, but we're we're coming into the industry, especially with a lot of the newer technologies, that it's it's something that's really important. And we found it so important we put it on the entire series of our meters. But it's your inrush current. Or sometimes, depending on again the meter you have, you may see it as LRA. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
which stands for your locked rotor amps. And that's important because your meter may have a min-max function. <clears throat> but the inrush current happens so quickly, most of the time your max button won't capture it. So it's that initial startup. So we have built in your locked rotor amps or inrush current so you can see how much energy is drawn upon the initial startup. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic um, add-on for motor diagnostics. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's such an important thing, and we were so many requests out there for it now. Sure, I can see that. Uh, yeah. Ooh, there's an interesting one, especially any of us that use some of our older meters, and now that we're starting to have a lot of inverter products that have you know varying frequencies across the board. Hmm. Okay. Tell us a little bit about low Z. Yeah. So low Z, it's it's a setting on there, but we know, um, especially in today's world, working in tight panels, those type of things you're going to wind up with what we call ghost voltages. And so you're going to get an error reading on your meter. You're not going to get the right reading. So we actually built in low Z again on that meter series for us, but that low Z is going to filter out those ghost voltages. So maybe you're working in a control panel. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of wires all together. A lot of stray voltages. You get a lot of them. And so that low Z functionality is going to help bleed those out. So you get a more accurate reading. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. That is the thing that we started seeing, especially when we started having VFD drives and inverter controls, when we had voltages that were being diverted through controls. And so we can pick up some additional ghost voltages. Yeah. Especially when we have a lot of conductors intermingled in, you know, small chases. Exactly. And there's a lot more wires in a lot smaller places nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Very good addition. Hmm. How are we flowing here? Exactly. So this is, this is your diode functionality. So it's really easy to just say something like the board's bad, but is it the board bad? Do you have a bad diode? Have you actually tested? So that diode function is going to create that small small voltage between the leads. Exactly. And allow you to make sure that you don't have any unbroken paths or malfunctions within it. Yes. So I like how you've added all of the components that should not have voltage applied to them into the one key tab. Uh, so it gets all of them isolated. Everything else we could have voltage applied. These are all the tool itself is going to be generating its small amount of voltage that's going to be used for test purposes. So we have to make sure that anything we're doing in this function, any of those four components, needs to be done with power off on our control circuit. Excellent observation. Yeah. Very cool. Mmm. Does it be? So this is this is one. Uh, that's easy to demonstrate. It's one of the few things, you know, generally when I'm I'm at a, a counter day or a show or something, but it's it's just testing continuity, right? We want to make sure, is the electricity actually flowing through? Is it making a complete, complete circuit? circuit? It's also a really easy way to check if your test leads are going bad. Oh, yeah, so, <clears throat> sure. So even though your test leads, you know, I know everybody out there is very careful with them and, you know, they wrap them, unwrap them, put them very gingerly in the case. Um, for those, maybe you let somebody borrow your meter and they've they've wrapped it up, or maybe they uh, they've used their meter in places they shouldn't use their meter. Uh, it's a good idea to check your test leads and make sure that they are working properly. And the continuity test is a very easy test to be able to put them on there. So if you set it to continuity and you put your two test leads together, so when you do that. Generally, we'll hear the, the round of beeps going on to let us know that that circuit is going well. And that's just a, a quick, easy check to be able to check your test leads. <laughs> Getting me a little tongue tied here. That's right. Uh, that's OK. There um, we go. I actually had to move mine over because I had it set on manual. To be able to ah. get the continuity, I had to actually manually set it over on continuity. Yep. Yeah, so when we get to do that in a live classroom and everybody has their readers, it's like a yep. little marching band going on for sure. us. You know, you can play a little song and dance and everything. Uh, but it's a good idea to check your test leads. It's one of the easiest things, and it's the most common, one of the most common problems uh, that people run into with their meters when they suddenly feel like they're not working. Did you check your test leads? So just a nice little way to be able to check that. Absolutely. <clears throat> 
we have some safety functions built into meters too, right? So non-contact voltage, a lot of times think about it. They had uh, the little sticks that that you can use to test if a, if a circuit's live or not. A little wiggy. Exactly. We want to make sure that everybody is safe out there. Uh, you know, I always use the example of, um, I live in an older house and uh, they may not have marked the box as well as one might think. Sure. So you go out there and you, you think you got the right switch. Eh, it might be a little bit dicey out there, right? So we always want to make sure when we're testing and it's in places that we should have things turned off that we actually do. So you're able to use the non-contact voltage. Um, it has high and low detection available on there and it's built in right into the tip. All you got to do is turn your meter on and it's going to be built right there into the tip and it's going to start beeping at you. Uh, okay. when we get, and so as we have right now, and then when we get closer to the actual um, circuit, if it's live, it's going to start really ramping up for you. Okay. How about that? All right. No. All right. And that's built into the tip of the amp probe. Exactly. It's built yeah. right into there to make it easy for you. Okay. So I recommend always having a meter that has one, um, yeah. especially <coughs> if you don't have a little little stick to be able to chat, test sure. it with. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. <sighs> Then another important functionality is actually being able to read your frequency, your hertz, and your duty cycle. Sure. Right? It's starting to become a lot more important as we're moving into three-phase motors. Exactly. And so why not buy the meter that already has the functions as we start moving to that, right? So, sure. So your frequency, it's the number of occurrences repeating. And then when we get into the duty cycle, it's the, the fraction of the period which a signal is active. So when we're looking at, and you'll find those a lot of times in the manufacturer specs. So while I know a lot of manufacturers put in like fail safes in there and they have like um, their control boards that kind of tell you what the faults are, it's always a good idea to be able to double check those in there. Sure. Okay. Another nice little feature. Uh, and then temperature. Right, because temperature is also an important thing, especially when we're working in the the air conditioning and refrigeration, um, and it even comes in handy when we're working in the uh, the combustion world. Uh, but it's the ability to read temperature. Sure. So and I have to tell you, go ahead. Yeah. So we're using K type thermal couples. So once again, we're supplying a small amount of voltage through a variable resistor so that as the temperature changes on our variable resistance it affects the voltage coming back through our thermistor so very much like when we start talking about inverter technology where we're using pressure transducers and temperature thermistors same principles we're going to apply a voltage to a component that changes voltage based on temperature so we're applying small voltage into our thermocouple and that variable voltage coming back is going to be read through our meter so now we have the opportunity to do two separate temperature readings all from our meter right and the important thing though when we're doing temperature remember we're an international company so you have to make sure are we on fahrenheit or are we on celsius mm, yeah right mm -hmm. it's, it's like if you've ever listened to the canadian weather forecast and sure. they're like it's a high of 10 today and right you, it's july yeah. like, I <laughs> what happened to you right and then it dawns on you that's oh, a heck yeah, of an arctic blast celsius instead of on fahrenheit sure so yeah. we always want to be cognizant of you know fahrenheit or celsius if you feel like your numbers are really off that's a that's a good way to double check make sure that you have it on the f for fahrenheit or c for celsius uh, depending on the model that you have, uh, you may be able to get multiple temperatures. So the one that Clifton has, um, has two K-type thermocouples in it. And you're actually not only able to get your T1 and your T2, but then it'll calculate out that Delta T for you. So no math involved. Okay. Now, one of the important things, Clifton, as you're putting that in, right? Yeah. So there's a little switch on your, on your meter. So you can't actually read amps and volts and do temperature at the same time look at yeah. that all right a that safeguard a feature right there for you okay and so then 
I need to bring that down to the temperature, which opens up the shutter so that I can actually insert my temperature probes. Okay. And the other thing that I always like to caution people about, it's really hard to do. And you you seem to get it right on the right, <clears throat> on the first uh, first round there, is uh, making sure that you have your polarity right. So yeah, I did notice that. Thermocouples. <clears throat> you have two prongs. You have a wider prong and a narrower prong. And it coordinates just like an electrical outlet, right? If you've tried to plug in an appliance and it's it's upside down, it's really hard to plug in. Yeah. Occasionally somebody occasionally somebody is able to to make that happen, but um making sure that our polarity, so right, the wider probe goes at wider prong goes into the wider side and the narrow uh, a good fails or a good check though is if for some reason you've managed to uh to reverse that polarity. Right. Quick thing that you can kind of take a look at is if you're putting it on something that you know is supposed to be cold and you see your temperature going up. That's a good sign that you've reversed your polarity. <laughs> okay. um, some meters won't give you a reading at all. They're right. they're going to, but a lot of times it's very common that you're going to see your reading going in the opposite direction of what you're looking for. And these are actually labeled positive <laughs> and negative on both the probe and on the meter itself. Yes. Okay. And when you're working with the K-types, it's a little bit more obvious. When we talk about those banana plugs, it becomes a little less obvious sometimes, and it's 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 even easier to reverse that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so I can do temperature differential as well. So if I am, say I'm reading a temperature split across an evaporator, I can utilize both of those and do the difference of temperatures as well. Yes. Okay. And then there's a difference, you know, you may hear things like thermocouple and you may hear a thing, a thermistor. So it's a little bit different in how that technology works. A thermistor has a little bit narrower uh, range that it's going to be able to do, but it's generally a little bit more responsive. Right. So when we're working on some of those refrigeration things, a thermistor is going to be a little bit more important because you want those readings. Okay. Awesome. Get that back in operation. Yeah, and then there's some other nice features and just different symbols to be aware of when you're looking at your meter. Uh, so, you know, we talked earlier about inrush current, and I yep. mentioned that at the, the max, which will capture the max, but inrush happens so fast that even max doesn't generally be able to capture it. But when you're looking at something for a period of time, it may be very handy to be able to get that max capture or that minimum capture while sure. you're monitoring the system. Sometimes auto ranging, you may see it abbreviated as a capital A and a capital ah, T on your yes, meter. Yes, absolutely. And then there's the APO. Which button. caught me off guard the first time I had seen that one. Had to ask Luis what the APO was on the meter. Which is I your auto that. power off. <laughs> right. Uh, to help you conserve a little bit of your battery if you yeah. to turn it off. Uh, that way you're not running to the next job site with a dead meter that's been running all day in your vehicle. It'll actually power off for you. A thing that's often overlooked, though, is that low battery and why that's important. So we were talking about being able to generate, right? We were yeah. being able to generate that small voltage. So if you have low batteries, your meter's not able to generate as well. Sure, it could affect our it. capability. Exactly. So it's always important if you see that uh, that low battery thing, go ahead and just change out your batteries. Um, and the other nice thing is we try to use all batteries, your double A's, your triple A's. Common battery uh, sizes. Exactly. Things sure. that are going to be very common for you. Yep, absolutely. Um, there's a hold and a capture value that you may be able to see, right? So that hold max, hold min, that way it's displayed on your screen when it gets there. And then my last one is that wireless connection. Yeah, which I've been having some fun with here. I, I have no doubt. <laughs> I love technologies. All right. And I love the ability to be able to monitor and then do other things. Continue working while I'm monitoring. I love to be able to put my tools on a piece of equipment and go do other things, but still be able to see what kind of changes are happening. Say I'm looking at a temperature differential across a piece of equipment. I'm wanting to go take a look at duct work. I'm going to change filters. I'm wanting to make some changes to the system. Can I do that more efficiently? Well, if I have connected tools, 
then I am open up that opportunity to do those things remotely. So yeah, tell me a little bit about your capabilities with the meter. Yeah, so the the one that you have, the DL599, it has a free app that you're able to download. And it really allows you to log, store, and record. Yeah, so that's the UEI app. That's oh, the nope, you got to change your screen. <laughs> I thought you were pulling up the app. I was oh, I just showed it on the main screen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so nothing when we first turn it on, though. Not going to immediately connect. Correct. So you're going to have to hit that on, on your meter. Um, you'll see the little icon. And you're going to be able to click and hold that. And then you're going to see BT on your Boom. screen, and it's going to be able to connect right to your phone. Right. Makes an instant connection. Gives me the ability to do my work here on the piece of equipment and walk away and have full connectability to my meter. And I, I like it because some, some pieces of equipment, some tools that I've worked with, the reading is just the display. And what I have found that I really like about this scenario is I can actually change a lot of my functions, my button functions of my meter, I can do remotely from my app. So it's not just a, I'm going to send you some information so that you can look at it remotely. It's I'm going to send you some information and you can still control me completely separate. Yes, that that shows that you definitely did get some time to, to check out the meter before. Yeah, yeah. Even, even my light, I can do yeah. remotely which is a neat little function. Yeah, and you know, there, there's certain tests, right? So if we're talking about some of the blower door tests, yes. where you actually have to have that door shut. Yeah. If you have your test leads running out, how are you gonna shut that door all the way? Right, absolutely. So you're gonna be able to to shut the door and still be able to see your readings live on your, on your phone. Use my supplied magnet on the back of the instrument, which can be pulled into a strap for remote mounting. And I can now attach it to a metal surface inside of my cabinet. And off I go with my remote readings, remote yes. operation. Okay, very cool. And tracking, tell me a little bit about tracking and recording. So you can record everything. Um, it's a it's a simple functionality on there to be able to do it. And then you're able to just send out those results. Sure. Uh, so that's not even going to, and it sends it out in multiple formats. So whether you want it in a list form or you want it in a C, uh, C, uh, CSV, CSV? <laughs> tongue tied, I'm telling you. That's all right. You. I'm with you. <laughs> or an Excel, you're able to send that right out. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. All right. I like it. Now we're improving some efficiency here. I, I love being able, and I think we've talked about it. It's going to be a central theme for a long time in our industry. The yeah, more efficiently is. that we're going to be able to work, uh, the the better off we all are going to be because there is that shortage that's coming soon. Yes. Yes. Definitely. So uh, resolution. Yep. Making sure. So we were talking about the fact that it had an auto ranging on your meter, and it's being able to make sure what your ranges are, right? So when we're looking at it, when I was talking about microfarads. So that's going to be kind of that reverse G, lowercase u with the F next to it. So that's your microfarads. We may be looking at, maybe we're looking at our milliamps. Yeah, milliamps, millivolts, yeah. Exactly. So we want to make sure that we have um, the lowercase m when we're looking at milli. And then if we were working on something much higher than that, we may want to be on our mega. Sure, absolutely. So making sure that you know what symbol is associated with your amps and your volts. Yeah, so there, this is the one that we were kind of alluding to earlier. When we were talking yep. about voltage capabilities of our meters, there are different categories that meters are developed in based on voltage capabilities. So let's look at those real quick. Yeah, so I think the cat ratings are really important. And there's a whole lot of text on this screen, right? That that kind of tells you. And I think sometimes words or uh, pictures speak a million words for us. So right. we can read about what CAT2, CAT3, and CAT4 are, but let's take a look about what that really looks like when we're working in a house. And I always like to start a little bit uh, backwards from how most people do it, is I like to start at the highest and work my way down. Sure. Um, in my brain, that just seems to work a little bit better. Uh, but let's talk about CAT4. So 
a lot of our meters are going to be rated cat four and cat four is actually everything from the power line to the house. And so for most everybody that's probably on this call, we're never going to be working on something that is category four. Right. Typically However, 600 volts. Mm -hmm. However, we build in those protections, right? So if you have a cat four meter, that's cat four and your cat ratings are on your meter. If they're not on your meter, it's definitely time for a new meter um, and probably one that's going to have all the UL rated uh, safety ratings. But so on this one that I'm looking at, it is cat four. Oh no, my DL40 has no cat rating on it. I think I might have to replace it. I, I've been telling you that, but you know. It but... still works though. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to try working on a car with four volts DC. It doesn't help very much. But the reason that we put in category four for something like that is it's an overload protection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a safety feature to make sure that your meter isn't going to blow up on you because you've applied too much to it. Sure. So what's category three? So category three is really what we're going to be looking a lot at. So category three is, is from that control box, your control panel to the outlet or to the hardwired appliance. Right. So when we're looking at our AC systems, we're looking at our furnaces. furnaces and, right. Yeah. Those are generally going to be in your category three. Uh, so that's everything that is hardwired and or from the box to the outlet. So everything so, in between those. So we really need to have a category three or higher rated meter in the HVAC industry. Correct. OK. Makes sense now. And then when we look at category two, Category two is going to be from the outlet to the actual appliance. Mm, okay, cord and plug. Exactly. Uh, and then there is technically category one. Those are going to be the things that are within the actual appliance. So if we were to take apart something like maybe a computer or something like that, where we're not going to have high, we could get away with category one. Oh, okay. But yeah. At minimum... At minimum, for an HVAC contractor, you need a Category 3 rated meter, preferable Category 4 for your safety protections. Yep, I get that. Because there are times we're going to you know, run into things, especially when we get into commercial and industrial environments, where we may run into higher than our typical 240 volt single phase power. Exactly. So that's, that's why it's important. We just want to make sure that you're safe out there because it's an important thing. Safety yeah. is one of our, our key components at UEI. Yep. I like being alive. Yeah. So that is just kind of how that breaks down, okay. right? So cool. quick recap, category four is going to be from the, the power line or the underground line to the box, to the meter. And then your category three is going to be from your control panel to either the hardwired appliance or the outlet. And then category two is going to be from your outlet to the appliance. Okay, nice. Very cool. Thank you. That's a good breakdown. Yeah. There's some other things, though, uh, as far as meters go, is that you may see some some ratings or some warnings on them. Okay. And one of, one of the ones um, is the IP rating. So yeah. IP stands for ingress protection. Okay. So that ingress ingress protection um, is going to tell you how dust or waterproof a tool may be. Sure. You see a lot of that these days, especially on component boxes. And, exactly. You know. So you see it on that. It's the same IP is an it's an international rating. It's going to be the same um, whether you're looking at test instruments. Uh, you'll see it if you ever go look at storage boxes. You'll yeah. see it when you go look at watches. It's it's a standard that has been set. Um but what, what do those numbers really mean? Yeah, exactly. So if I'm we curious. look at it, exactly, like, oh, great, it's yeah. IP42. Yeah, I, what, I, yeah, exactly. I, what's the difference between IP42 and IP54? What's an exactly. IP63? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it works just kind of a little bit like you might think. The higher the number, the better it is. Okay. But there's two numbers that are associated with right. it. Right. So that first... That first digit, so that four, that five that we were just talking about, yep. is uh, the time duration that it has solid particles. Oh. So that's basically going to be um, your dust, your dirt. Like, how much is it going to be able to do? And that has to do with, like, how many openings are into the unit and those yeah. type of things. Solid but particle the, exposure. Exactly. So the higher the number, 
the more resistant it's going to be to have anything that's going to wind up getting into it. Okay. And then the second digit, though, um, runs actually on a zero to nine as opposed to the zero to six. So if you see somebody that says I have an IP rating of like, you know, 82, you yeah. kind of have to wonder what's going on. Sure. Uh, Low for liquids, high for solids. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, that, that's a good explanation. I've actually this, not seen it displayed like that, but mm -hmm. very clear. So that number, right? That second digit. Yep. So that two that we two or that four that we just referenced, mm -hmm. that's the exposure to liquids. So that's the difference between something being, you know, no liquids around it to it can be splash proof uh, to it can be submerged underwater for X amount of time. Right. Like diving watches. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Huh. Yeah, I, I've always you know, I've seen the designations. I've just never had them explained to me before. That's really exactly. Cool. And that's that's part of the beauty of us being able to do this. Yeah, exactly. Everyone learns a little bit. We thank everyone for joining us today. Paul, hi. Say, Paul's out there saying hi to everyone. How's it going, Paul, Mark, uh, Patrick, Abu? Anyone um, joining in, learning about meters today, learning things that you didn't know before? Because it's actually been very enlightening to me. I really appreciate your time, Louise. Yeah, absolutely. And then... This is, I think, another important thing that yep. we want to make sure that we don't miss. Yeah. So there's been a common question. What's true, MR, true RMS? RMS, yeah. What does it really mean? What? Why do I need that in my meter? And why can't I just go for this less expensive one that doesn't say it? Yep. Good so point. true RMS. So this is a, a nice little, little breakdown for us to be able to look at it. But true RMS, in the, the shortest for, form, it's going to give you the most accurate readings. So true RMS is going to, I'm going to back up for just a second. So over on the left-hand side, you can see a sine wave, right? And it goes very melodic, up, down, up, down, up, down. And at an average sensing meter, it takes its reading every so often, and it's going to give you a reading. But we know that things don't always flow in a nice linear sine wave, right? Right. That sometimes we we get uh, some dirty power, um, especially with, you know, dimmer switches are, are a huge culprit, right? Mm -hmm. When those turn on, you might see some lights flicker or something like that. Um, you got a little dirty power going on in the house. And that average sensing meter may not pick up exactly what it is. And you're going to wind up with some errant readings. So basically what true RMS does in a meter is it slows down how it takes in that information and you're actually going to see those little blips. And so the way that I like to describe it, if you've been in the industry for a moment and you've looked at an analog meter, a lot of guys like having an analog meter and whether it was what they were used to, but when I really dug into it, a lot of times it was, I could see where that blip in, in the, you can see um, the variation. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that true RMS is going to be able to slow it down a little bit. And it's going to allow you to actually see those little variations that you wouldn't have seen on an average sensing meter. And you can see the more distorted the wave, the more off your meter is going to be. Yeah, makes sense. So that root mean square that we're looking for is a leveled out voltage, a more consistent voltage instead of getting our, our peaks and our valleys all from it. Exactly. So okay. through RMS, that's why it's so important is that you're going to be able to have the most accurate readings. Yeah, that's interesting to see the variances with the averaging RMS meters versus true RMS and the potential for up to 40% variance on, you know, on the one degree distorted waves. And, you know, we may not encounter that, but just, you know, being able to be aware of the differences between conventional meters and averaging and true root mean square meters. Yeah. And the the whole line that we've been talking about is true RMS, which makes it really easy uh, that you don't generally have to think a whole lot about it. Right. We, yeah. we built it in. It was a technology, if you remember, because your DL40 is not true RMS, I'm going to guess. No, <clears throat> it was an expensive technology. It used to be something that was a premium to be able to to be able um, and it, it just like, you know, TVs. Remember when flat screen TVs came out, like 
you know, it was a couple thousand dollars for a little tiny flat screen. Sure. And now for like, you know, a couple hundred dollars, you can have like a 3000 inch TV. <laughs> yeah. So the technology has changed. The availability of using, yes. you know, quality technology in our tools is really progressed in the last few years. Yeah. And with the, the new technology of the equipment that, that everybody's installing, having that accurate read is even more it's important crucial. than it ever has been. Yep. Absolutely, it is. Anybody ever pull out their wiring diagram? Take a uh -huh. look at it. I love them. Yeah. There's mine. You have that's, see. That's for that particular furnace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just remember, your wiring diagram is your friend, especially when you're using your meter. Uh, it's going to show you where you need to be and everything. Um, everything that you're looking for. I know it's a little small. I have yet to figure out how to blow one up. I think maybe I need to take a, a little section of it, but- um, Yeah, piece you know. them out. Yep. Yeah, but they, they are overwhelming sometimes. Uh, but being able to, to actually take a look at it um, and figure out where we should be and what we're looking at is an important thing. Yep, definitely. So we, we kind of touched base on them um, as we went through the presentation, but you know, just remembering all the practical applications. And, and it's amazing um, that we kind of go on on auto auto mode, right? Like we know we do X, Y, and Z, but are we really thinking about why we're doing X, Y, and Z, right? Sure, so absolutely. We want to make sure that we're testing outlets. We're testing those blower motors. Um, when we're looking at furnaces, we may want to be able to check the flame rectification. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, whole, whole separate class. We'll come back to that one. That is, that is a whole separate class, uh, but it is an important thing to be able to check. We want to be able to check continuity. We want to be able to check those capacitors if we have any board issues, and even we can check test the gas valve. So those those are some of the things that your meter is going to be able to help you uh, discern. And having the right meter that has all of that capabilities is really important for you. Yeah, absolutely. And so I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little yeah. bit about our clamp meter line. Let's learn about the UEI line of meters. Now we've yeah. got a couple of them here anyhow. We do. Actually, you know what? We really simplified our line. Um, one of the things that when you start looking at it, we've we've gone to a lot of good, better, best models. Yep. We want to make it easy because we know there's a lot of choices in the world and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So there's a few things. Um, as far as that goes, we have three core HVAC meters, our DL579, our DL589, and our DL599. Um, a little bit different in size, so Clifton's been showing off the DL599 today during the class. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a little bit of a smaller meter, which is our DL579. Right. I got to tell you, the DL579, it has a lot of really good features and a lot of those features that we were talking about in the presentation um, is the fact that all of our core HVAC meters are true RMS. They all have the ability to do inrush current. They all have that low Z functionality on them. They're all dual display. And if you were playing on, if you turned yours around Clifton, you would see that it has the built-in test lead holders. It has a backlight non-contact voltage and the thing that i love is the fact that they all have captive screws in them so you remember you were talking about there was some screw repair that you had to do because you had a couple screws loose uh we actually not you, not <laughs> no, you. What, hold on now i might have to, i might have to edit that out <laughs> <laughs> yes i might have a couple screws loose you can't yeah. fix those though <laughs> yeah you know but we put in captive screws right okay because it's it's really easy we're working on a lot of tiny things we got a lot of things going on maybe our our uh screwdriver got demagnetized for whatever reason you wind up changing out your batteries and now you've lost the screw it's it's an easy thing to do and it just takes up time, right? Finding a replacement. So we made it easy. We did the nice little captive screws. Um, that way you don't have to worry about them. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So then we move on up to our DL589 meter, which adds some features. So DC all of those amps. things. DC amps through the amp clamp. Okay. Yep. Especially, I mean, that is so important nowadays with the, the inverter and uh, VFD technology right. going out there. Yep. I could see that one. We added the fact that you can now do a dual, dual temperature to it. 
Okay. So the other one's a single probe. It's a single temperature, right? Okay. So we've upgraded to that dual temperature. We've also added those back probes. So we know that when you're working on mini splits, you have those little, little Molex plugs that you're forever trying to get in there. And so we added the back probes right on there for you. They're nice little screw on back probes. Yeah, those are really cool. Yeah. Uh, be careful with them. They are. Yeah, they're sharp. <laughs> they are sharp. I, I've caught myself a few times. I may have sat on one one time. Well, oh, that's a whole other story <laughs> for a different day. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, we added the fact that it has not only the backlight on that display, but it has that work light you were talking about. Yeah. We added, it comes with the magnet. That's that strap magnet. Uh, it comes with a rubber over molding. So if you look yeah, at it, that nice like plastic. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Clifton, I think when you were, um, when you were doing your demonstrations there, I think you had some gloves on as well, right? Yep. Absolutely. So, did you notice that the dial was a little bit texturized there for I you? I did so you notice could... that, yes. Yeah, so it's just those little things. Okay. And then we give you a little bit longer warranty. Uh, instead of a one year on the 579, you get a two year when you go to the premium side. Okay. And then moving on to, and I have to say, so this was a dealer design um, award-winning meter in 2022. Nice. Is the DL599 that Me you too. have there. This one might not come back. I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll chat later. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but what's really nice is, and we, we covered it, is the fact that it has the app functionality. Yeah, so there's really a multitude cool. of purposes to be able to have that. Uh, something that we didn't really touch on, but what helped win it its award is that it has uh, some three-phase motor rotation testing and a motor unbalance test. So, what? Yeah, so when we're working on three-phase, you're actually going to be able to see your legs and see if they're all lined up. Oh, we're going to come back to that one. That's another episode because that's some inverter diagnostics right there. Exactly, and I will be happy to come back along with you for that one, okay. all right? Yeah, I um, yes, absolutely. As okay. well as that motor unbalance test. Okay. So we have a, in the HVAC meter line, a good, better, best. All qualified, all good for different levels of progression as a technician. And, you know, one of the things that we didn't touch base on that I, I have to say we've done really well on. If you notice in this bottom right-hand corner, there's a little logo that says designed by us and made by us. Yeah. If, uh, if, if you aren't familiar um, with our line, we actually own our own factories. So the bulk majority of the products are designed and made in a UEI or cane facility. Nice. So all of our combustion analyzers are manufactured in the UK. And then all of our meters are manufactured in um, our South Korean factory. Okay. So that has made it really nice. It's one of the things I'm really excited about for working for UEI is right. that we have the ability to control the tools that we are putting out. Yeah, big deal. And that's a lot of information. I, I, I can't even lie. That's a lot of information. <laughs> that's a good class, <laughs> though. Yeah, you know, there, there's so many questions about, you know, what does each component do? What are all of these different things on the meter? You know, why do I have so many selections? What does each button do? What are all these ranges for? And it breaks it down so we have an understanding of what each one of those are for. And if we are a technician, we're students, it gives us an idea of what we're looking at. Do I need to jump right into a 599? Well, if I'm not working on inverters, I might not need to yet, but it could be a good investment if I plan on doing that. If I get a 579, is it going to cover everything that I need coming out of school going into the field? going to be a really really good meter for you so it gets a nice variety depending on what level of progression you are out in the field i, I like this a lot yeah and, and we try to make it easy for you so you can you can find graphs like this on our website uh, if you were in your local wholesaler and you picked up one of these it actually shows you a progression to what the next meter adds for you right there yeah. on the box i like that yeah and all right, so I'm not going to lie. I'm a big fan of accessories. If you've met me in person, you already know. Um, you know, whether it's shoes, rings, or purses, right. meters, they don't come with any of those things. But they do have accessories that come with them okay. or added accessories. So Tools for the collection. Exactly. And those are going to be really important, though, right? Because, yeah. you know, everything that you pretty much need 
um, for your meters come with your meters. So depending on what meter you have, you'll have different test leads. Um, so I get a lot of questions though, is, you know, there's standard test leads, but then there's silicone test leads. What, right. what makes a difference? And so if you're not aware, silicone test leads, they're going to be more flexible mm -hmm. and they're going to be more heat resistant. Yeah. And I didn't realize that we're jumping up, jumping up into that category four rating as well. Once we get into the silicone. Correct. Well, and you know, I'll tell you, do you, here's your fun fact for the day of what makes a, a test lead from category three to category four. Oh yes. Those please little do. Little tiny caps. So, you know, those caps that you pulled off your, your, your test leads and go, Oh, why do I want to use that? It's the amount of tip that can be exposed is hmm. the difference that makes the differences between category three and category four. Okay. Thank you for so, that little tidbit. That is, that is your fun fact. Fun fact the of the day. Fun you better wasn't Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, you know, depending on the meter, you may need specialized test leads. So sure. one of the things on that 589 and 599 that you saw, um, you notice that the test lead input was actually on the bottom. As I did notice that. Front. Yes. Yes. So that that allows there's there's a few different reasons on the engineering side for that. But you want to make sure that you have right test leads that are going to make the good connection for you. OK. And then, you know, depending on maybe you have an older style meter that didn't come with like the back probes that we were talking about earlier and they're important. Yeah. So you need to know, are there back probes that I can get? What are the applications I'm doing? So we actually do have a standardized back probe kit that you can buy for, for a lot of our previous model meters, um, as well as depending on what you're working on, we have kits um, that are going to include, like there's ones that are gonna be a little bit longer. Um, you're gonna be able to have, you know, a larger alligator clip. Um, and you're actually gonna have one of the test lead grabbers. So if you're trying to get into one of those, those tighter areas, you may need that type of test lead. Sure, that yeah, makes sense. And then we were talking about K-type thermocouples, yep. right? So um, the top the top two are going to be your standard K-type that are going to be the, the, the prong ones that we were talking about that with your pluses and your minuses and your wider prong and your, your smaller prong. Um, but it's also some of the meters have what I, I refer to as the banana type K, yeah. uh, thermocouples. And so they're still a K-type. So they're going to have the same range that it's a different you're, fitting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's also where, because those are going to plug right into um, your meter instead of into the separate uh, temperature plugs. So when we're looking at that probe, we want to make sure that we're following where the positives and the negatives are. And that's, this is the one that's really easy because there's nothing that like, you're not trying to force it in. It's going to fit. Right. You're just one not going to the, the right temperatures yeah. on there. Okay. And also knowing that there's pipe clamps out there. Mm -hmm. available yeah, absolutely. For you, Good demand right? for those. And knowing which type of pipe plant that you want to be able to use. I will tell you uh, that ATT PC4, it's my personal favorite out of the two pipe plants. A lot more durable. Um, it's, it's a, a larger little, expanding too, isn't it? A little bit. Um, it's easy to open. It has a harder, um, a harder plastic use. Um, Going to be able to take a little bit more abuse than than what your standard pipe clamp is. So I think it's also important to know what your accessories are. Yeah, definitely. So sweet. That's a lot of good stuff on meters. I'm sure there's a lot of people going out there. Did I just sit through an hour and ten minute class on what symbols on a meter look like? And yes, you did. We thank you for joining us. You know, there's a lot of details on just the meter that we overlook. We love technologies. We love talking about things that are progressing in the industry, but we have to know what we're looking at because our tools are progressing just as fast as our equipment is. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us. All right, Luis, how can people contact you or UEI for further training opportunities, for further details on products? Sure. Easy way, you could always uh, contact us. We have a, an 800 number if you want to talk to a live person, 1-800-547-5740. Uh, uh, we also recommend our website, which you can find us at uh, ueitest.com. Uh, or if you want to reach out to me personally, uh, send shoot me an email. Uh, it's my first name, Louise, L-O-U-I-S-E 
the letter K as in Keller, because that's my last name, at ueitest.com. So Louise K at ueitest.com. All right. Fantastic. Well, we sure appreciate everyone hanging in. This was a very informative class. Louise, I, I really enjoy you putting this, this together for us. I am glad that we were we were finally able to connect and make this one happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us. We look forward to future conversations with Louise and other educators from our industry. And we will see you all again next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. See you later.